stumble across this thing for a little while. Now it's looking really good. So let me log into, uh, well, well, let me just give a, a brief intro to what we're doing. So we are running a scanning electron microscope and you can see the body of it right there. And then you can see the screens that we're using. And so the microscope has a big, has a column. It's, uh, it's called a scanning electron microscope. The samples that we're looking at are inside this chamber that's kind of like a safe. And they're under vacuum. And we can see uh, what the inside of the chamber looks like. There's a conical uh, part at the top. And that's where the electrons are coming from. They're, they're coming out of there and they're raftering across the sample the same way that a TV works. And you can see the sample in there. It doesn't, the camera is not nearly as nice as the uh, electron microscope uh, image capability. And so what we're doing is we have a whole bunch of insects and arthropods sitting on little metal stubs inside the microscope and we have the labels we've labeled what most of them are so there's a inch and three quarter stub in there that's got um, carbon tape on it and the insects and arthropods are stuck to that there's a 12 um, millimeter stub that has some fleas on it and then there's a one inch stub that has um, a bee and some other things on it those are all coated with gold palladium which makes them conductive they're grounded with silver paint to uh, make sure that the conductive charge goes to the uh, to the uh, carbon and goes to ground. And everything inside there is is uh, we've tried to make it conductive. Everything's in a vacuum, and inside that vacuum, then we're able to raster electrons across anything that we want to see, and then we focus the electron beam. And that allows us to go and look at various features of whatever is in here. So right now, we're focusing on this is a, one of the compound eyes of this roly-poly. And so it looks like a little raspberry. And they probably cannot see very well. It's a, it's a really kind of a primitive eye. The things that you see that are bent around on each side that look kind of like horns are the antennae. And then you see that um, the roly-poly has a kind of like a mustache, but it's kind of like a weak one. Roly-polies are called isopods. And this one looks like it has seven pairs of legs. And they're called isopods because iso means the same and pod means foot. And the idea is that each of the little feet is about the same. So this is what we're looking at, one of the feet of a roly-poly. And, and I'll just chime in here that uh, uh, isopods actually are not insects. So even though this is called frog scope, these are uh, crustaceans. Um, they're one of the few groups of crustaceans that have managed to uh, um, colonize land. Um, you're logging into Zoom for the plan, Scott? What? You're logging into Zoom right now on my computer, is that your plan? Yeah, I'm going to try. Okay. Yeah. I need to find my, my email and then go from there. So you're welcome to, to click on presets and drive around if you'd like to. Um, you can click on any one of those things. And just double click on it and it will drive to that place. Ooh. Okay, and we just went by a really cool bee. And we came to an assassin bug. Ooh, this is an ambush bug. And, and, and so it has these really gnarly, gnarly arms. So if you double click like right right there, you can see that they have a retention device right there which they can grab things and they have like little sort of like some like features on them. So if we go like this and then bounce the mag up and then 
focus right there. Bring the light up a little bit with like an inch, I guess. So let's fix the brightness. This is really cool. Oh wow, look at that. That's crazy. I've never seen these guys with stuff up before. So this is um here's the auto contrast and brightness if I go to the other. So you can see that this is really these really beautiful features right here are what the uh, assassin bug is using and they're sitting on either side they're facing each other so they're almost like teeth and those little tiny really beautiful teeth are what the assassin bug uses to grab its prey when it wants to kill its prey and bite them it can hold them really well Praying mantises are something like that as well. Yeah, yeah, these are what we call raptorial four legs. So this is a probably it looks like to me um, a species of spinata, which is a they're they're a type of assassin bug called ambush bug. I um, mean they're they're quite small, only a couple millimeters long, um, but they can take down prey that's like much bigger than them. So you can often see them eat like bumblebees, um, which is kind of impressive. Um, but they'll they'll basically just sit. They're called ambush bugs. So they basically just sit on uh, like like goldenrod or other wildflowers. Um, and just kind of wait for something like a pollinator or other insect to show up. And then when it does, they grab with these, these raptorial legs and, and, and eat, eat them. Um, is that way to zoom back out? Hit minus. minus. Hit minus a few times. Yeah. And then you can also get rid of that small screen by doing that. Okay, so now you can drive around. You can. You can click with so your clicking here, like click with the sensors. yeah, and you can click with the roller ball and drive like ah, this. Ah, look at that! So you can drive around to little pieces, and then when you want to go to a higher mag, like you want to look at this little foot, and we can double click to center it. We can bring that up, and is that the the right. Uh, mouse button. Uh, the right, right mouse button focuses. So now we've got a pretty good focus. We can go, and you can see one of its little hands. Oh, look at that! Yeah, so this is the, the carpal claws of this, this insect. What it, what it uses basically to grip the substrate that it's on. Um, but I wanted to see if I got the hang of this now. Um. Oh yeah, I think I'm getting the hang of it. Um, so this is the uh, the mouth part of this assassin bug, and assassin bugs are they're they're true bugs, um, uh, and true bugs all have this sort of like beak-like mouth part that's referred to as the rostrum, and they basically use this to to puncture and uh, inject their prey with saliva, whatever they're eating, um, and then uh, and then suck the, the food back up like a like a straw. Um, so Same way, uh, uh, structure right here, like a, like a mosquito or a spider. Yeah, or a spider. Yeah, um, kind of similar to that. Um, if we can zoom in on this. Oh, no. There we go. Alright, I think I'm getting in focus. Maybe I'm going back. So, to make it so that you can see better, go ahead and put a small screen there. And now you have the ability to focus left and right. Also, does that um, like speed up how fast it adjusts? It, just, the... it gives you a, a thing to focus on so that you can just pay attention to that one particular thing. So, you can see that I messed up the contrast and brightness. So we can fix that. We can change it like this, make it brighter and darker. And then we can bring the mag up and we can. Well, we've even got some sensory hairs on this. Yeah. With the rock. Yeah, that's not surprising. And then what's really cool, what's really interesting, is it has this like little feature where it looks like it can make noises. All those little. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, a couple of fasten bugs can squeak. I don't know if I've ever heard these guys squeak, but they'll basically will rub their um, 
the rostrum against that that sort of like graded area and it'll make like a a sound. I don't remember what it's used for. Um, but that's cool that you can really do that up close. I don't know what all these little like wart like structures are in the cute ball computer ball. I can't tell if that's like maybe pollen or something that the bug got into if it's actually a structure on this cuticle. Oh, there's a yeah, I think that's the structure on the cuticle, but you'll also see pollen and things like that. Oh yeah, so um, Beckman Institute in the chat so that you guys can ask questions if you have questions. So please, yeah, we're happy to, to answer any questions that you guys have. So either speak up, put in the chat, or keep an eye on the chat um, so that I can answer any questions that you guys might have. Yeah, so that's almost certainly pollen or something. Small little box, the uh, bar right there. Let's zoom in on that. I'm just getting the hang of this. Good. Good, good, good. Josh and Scott, can you hear me? Yes. So we have a question in chat. So what's the most unexpected thing you found on a bug under the microscope? Oh, uh, that's a good question. What do you have to uh, What's the most unexpected thing that you found in a bug under a microscope? I feel like you probably want you more suited to answer that, Scott, since you've looked at a lot more bugs under an SDM than I have. Well, one of the things that we find that's really cool is we do find cool, you can see pollen right there, for yeah, example. Zoom in on that. And so this actually this thing that we've seen that looks like a washboard is really a big surprise. And then uh, sometimes we'll be looking at an insect like a wasp or uh, something like that. And we'll find brachosomes on that. And brachosomes are these tiny, really beautiful things that look like wiffle balls. And they're only on the surface. Uh, they're generally, they're only made by uh, leaf hoppers, but we find brachosomes on lots of other insects and it's because the other insects are preying on the leaf hoppers. So we'll show you some of those. Uh, and sometimes we find the most beautiful pollen grains. Uh, so sometimes also we'll find something weird like diatoms if the, uh, if the animal or the insect has been in the dirt and there are diatoms in that dirt. I'm regressing to the, the preset labeled brachosomes, so maybe we'll see. Oh well, that's not good. That's is okay. There, just so just you need to fix your contrast and brightness. Is there is there like an automatic way to do that? I have to do it by myself. Like anyway. Uh you can let me just try to get this going. No worries, no worries. Just have some Okay, I don't know. Do we want to have some people? All right. Well, we probably shouldn't have both microphones on. <laughs> okay, so so I'm going to come over here. This is really cool. So we're looking at, it's sort of a little bit hard to see what we're looking at. It looks just like kind of like a little mess. We're going to hit the contrast and brightness and see if we can adjust those a little bit. They're underneath the zoom bar, so it's a little bit tricky. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll go and we'll, and we'll bring the magnification up on this. And what you see is a whole bunch of little dots. And so they look kind of like eye facets. It's hard to tell what they are. So we're going to bring the mag up a little bit. And we 
just have to click the little plus button on this. And then we're going to put a small screen so we can focus better on that small screen. And we're going to bring the magnification up. And now we're in a kind of a cool place where maybe we don't need to uh, use the small screen anymore. And we're looking at the surface of the eye. And it's really cool. So these are the compound eyes. And they have brachisomes on them because the um, this is a leaf hopper, and the leaf hopper smears brachisomes all over its body. We're not entirely sure why. And then, if we want to see what they look like, we'll bring the magnification up. And I hope you can see these now. We'll bring them to a little bit higher mag. They're really, really beautiful little things like wiffle balls almost that are created in the Malpighian tubules of leaf hoppers. No other insects that we know of do this. And they are usually about 250 to 450 nanometers in diameter. So these are on the nano scale, really, really beautiful um, little wiffle ball like features. And a couple more questions in chat. I mean, there are people who are studying them because they think um, they may be able to use them for their research. So we have a whole group, and I don't know what, what they're going to be able to do, but they're just kind of studying them. So this is really cool because this looks just like a bunch of junk, but when we get up really close to it, it's really uh, beautiful. So I'd like to be able to, I'd like to drive around a little bit more and, uh, and look at some other things. We're going to go to uh, butterfly wing. Are you doing okay, dude? Yeah. And so now we have something that looks really out of focus. It's a wing scale from a butterfly. And if we focus on that wing scale, we can see these little ribs and we can see this little substructure to the scale. And if we fix the contrast and brightness a little bit, it's really beautiful. And so what? whenever you rub uh, the wing of a butterfly or a moth, and you see that little powdery stuff that's coming off, you're looking at an individual one of these little flake-like things. So these are like little um, ruffled uh, potato chips. And you can see, if you can see the micron bar, you can see that they're about a tenth of a millimeter across. They're really, really small. And then they have these little ribs that keep the structure uh, straight. And then between those ribs, you can see, or maybe not, you can see that they're about uh, two and a half microns uh, from rib to rib. And what's really neat about these is they create structural colors. So kind of like when you get one of those postcards and you turn the postcard and you get different images on it, one of those lenticular postcards, the uh, little wing scales are much like that. And because of the, um, the structure, the way that they're designed with those, or the way that they're built or the way that they form with those little lines in them, they interfere with the wavelengths of light and they create different colors. And sometimes, they're called structural colors instead of just regular pigmented colors. The structural colors can also give you, um, they can give you light that shows up in the UV. And so people really got ripped off. Humans are ripped off because we do not have the ability to see in ultraviolet. We have to use 
ultraviolet light and see how that reflects off of something to see if something is ultraviolet. Our eyes don't allow us to do that. But insects a lot of times can see in ultraviolet. Many insects and I think cats and things like that can see ultraviolet. So we really, really got ripped off. Uh, but the deal is that if you're looking at, for example, a monarch butterfly, we know what they look at. They're, they look like they're kind of like orange and they have little black uh, stripes on them. But to, uh, to another butterfly or to another insect, they may be a completely different color. They may be in the red range, for example. And it's because they're giving off ultraviolet light that we don't see. And so when insects are flying around and they want to identify each other, a lot of times they can see those uh, really beautiful colors and it gives them a, a completely different perspective than we get. Sometimes also when we look at these things that we're looking at right now, this is magnified 10,000 times. Uh, sometimes you'll also see pigment granules. So some of them are structural colors and sometimes they also have pigment granules in these little uh, features that we see between the ribs that we're looking at. Okay. Um, Scott, we've got two questions. Okay. Uh, one is, can bugs smile? And the other is, can bugs get COVID? And I think the answer is no to both. Yeah, that's correct. So they, they don't really have the kind of mouth parts that allow them to smile. I don't think they have the kind of muscles that would allow them to do that. And their mouth parts are usually different. So they actually do have biting, chewing mouth parts. Some have uh, piercing, sucking mouth parts like the true bug. Like, uh, for example, a bed bug is a true bug. Uh, and we have some true bugs on the stub. And so they, yeah, they don't really, they don't really smile. So you can't really tell what they're thinking about, I guess. I'm sorry. But if they, I guess if they were to be able to smile, like the insects that do have chewing mouth parts, uh, the, what would be equivalent to are the, the jaw bones, I guess, in insects or the, man, or the mandibles, and those are, they move sideways in most insects. So if they could smile, their smiles would be like roughly 90 degrees. That's right. That's right. Yeah, right. That's um, right. yeah there's, there's, I don't think there's any evidence that, that insects can transmit or uh, be infected with, with COVID, um, which is good. Oh yeah, so uh, uh, another question from the chat is, what is a true bug? So a true bug is a member of the um, insect or uh, mitra, uh, which means a uh, half wing, and that they, they, they often have um, wings that are, uh, at, the, at, the, at their base are, are quite leathery, leather-like, um, and then the tip are more membranous and, and, and transparent. Um, but uh, true bugs all have uh, piercing sucking mouth parts, so similar to the, the rostrum that we looked at in the casting bugs, casting bugs are true bugs. Um, so it's just it's just one type of, of insect um, it's referred to as true bugs. When you use the word uh, the term bug in like a scientific context, it refers to the, to those guys. Um, but most people use it refer to any sort of um, insect or spider or arachnid. Speaking of spiders. Oh yeah, look at that, it's a spider. We can see uh, six of its eyes. And then we can see the chelicers, the chelicerae right here, these great big things. And those will move apart. And then below them are the fangs. And unfortunately, we can't see the fangs very well. They're covered with teeth. Uh, but the, the fangs are uh, these curved things. And if we could see them up close, we would actually be able to see poison pores. But there's just too much, too much hair in the way, even though you can see this is really bad. I pulled off all the spider's legs. <laughs> so we would be able to see its face and we still can't see its face very well. So I'm sorry about that. So now we're going to look at the coolest little uh, honeybee. It's totally chilling. Is it in like a bumblebee in terms of like how hairy it is? Is it a bit of honeybee? Um, it has, it has, uh, forked feet. So, 
I thought it was a, and, and so we can tell, we can tell that something is a B, though I don't know for sure if it's a honeybee. Um, we can tell if something is a B if, if the seedy are branched like this. So insects that have, are bees or things that look like bees that have branched seedies, seedy, um, that's how we can tell what they are. No other kind of insect has has little branches on the, uh, these things that we're looking at, these little pieces. We've got another question in the chat from Colleen. Uh, she wants to know where we get the bugs from. Um, so uh, when people, um, like when classrooms and other groups sign up to do this, sometimes they'll, they'll collect their own bugs and, and mail them in. Um, uh, oftentimes, uh, entomologists that work in the university will just donate specimens to the Scott and Bugs too. So the, some of the ants that we'll probably look at or have looked at on the spot are probably for me from my different trips to different places. Um, so just sort of uh, around, otherwise just around uh, campus and town. There's like a cool bug of town you can look at it. Uh, is, this, is this the eye looking at? This is um, the antenna oh. of that little bee. And so we can see these sensory structures on it. There are many different kinds of sensory structures. So each of these little seed that's sticking up out of here um, has a function and it may be for, uh, it, it's a sort of like tasting the wind. Um, so some of them can uh, tell how wet the atmosphere is. Some of them can smell what the, the, the seed can smell. And then we also have these things called placoid sensilla that are on there. So those are plate-like sensory um, ap sensory structures like this one right here. And so I'm not really sure what it can do. You would think that maybe it could it could process sound because it's just sort of like a drum-like shape. There's just always, as much as you think you know about insects, there's always more and more, and it's really cool. Yeah, for sure. Never bored. Never bored. Um, so you can see that this Sita that's sticking up out of here is sort of got some fluting on it, and some of the other ones don't have any fluting. And it's kind of like a cool thing to, you have so many different things to study. We can also look at the mouth, and uh, Josh had described the uh, jaws earlier. The jaws open like a gate, kind of. So you can see on either side, you can see these hinges and those hinges open like a gate and they have, you can see the little uh, structures on there that would allow it to grip. And now I've got it out of focus, Let's pull the focus in a little bit. And you can see that one of these is chipped a little bit, or it may have some fluid on it and the fluid is dry more likely. So this is like the totally coolest B. And so you can see it's compound eyes on either side. If it didn't have so much uh, hair on the top of its head, we would see also the ocelli. There will be three ocelli on the top of its head that are more like simple eyes. This, what we see now is the labrum that's wrapped around the glossa, and the glossa is the tongue. And so we can bring the mag up a little bit, and we can see what the bee's tongue looks like up close. So we put a small screen on here so that we can work on the focus in just one place. And so now you can see what the uh, the tip of the tongue of a very small bee looks like. And then you can see its little hands. So it has claws.
request, uh, the chat has requested for a, a re-explanation of why what we're seeing is black and white and not in color. So what we're doing is we're beaming electrons at the sample and the things that we're looking at are so small that we wouldn't be able to see color probably anyway. Color is a wavelength of light. We're using electrons which are much smaller than the wavelength of light. So if we have a very, very fine stream of electron, electrons constantly rastering across the sample, they're much, much smaller than the wavelength of light. So for example, visible light that it has colors is 400 to 700 nanometers. Uh, in the, the wavelength is 400 to 700 nanometers. We're using an electron beam that may be a, a nanometer or two in diameter. So it's much, much smaller than the wavelength of light. And that means that we get really, really fine features that we can see, but we don't pick up color. And then the other thing is that when we're looking at the sample, um, the, in order to make the sample conductive, because insects are generally, they're not made of metal, so they're not conductive and they're not grounded very well, we coat them with gold palladium to make them conductive and the gold palladium makes them look silver. So even if they did, uh, even if we could see the color, the color would be uh, silver. I hope that makes sense. Please uh, let me know if, if you need more clarification. We're going to look and see if we can see the stinger. And the stinger is kind of covered by hair, but you can see And also, I should say that we're never supposed to call the CD hair, but we call them hair. Because hair is different than CD. So this is the tip of the, um, of the stinger. And it's not too much to look at. Sometimes they're a lot cooler looking and a lot creepier. I'd like to go and look at the mosquito now, unless somebody wants to see something else. So now we can see that it's very bright. We can change the brightness a little bit. We can put a small screen on its face and we can pull the focus up and we can make it a little bit brighter. Uh, I have a question, Scott. Yeah. So when you're when you're adjusting the brightness and contrast, are you are you doing that by changing the property of the electron beam or are you just adjusting the image in post so it's the same we're seeing? It's adjusting the it's the second. Oh. So so we just have the ability to, to control the brightness and control the contrast. And so it's sort of something that you could do anytime on any video screen, I think. But people normally don't need to change the contrast and brightness on their TV, yeah. for example. Yeah. So this is really, these are the compound eyes of the mosquito. You can see that the mosquito also has little scales on it like we looked at earlier. Scales are interesting because sometimes they're colored like on the wings of butterflies and moths. And sometimes scales are just kind of like these uh, gray accessory like things. So we know that scales come off really easily if you rub a butterfly's wing or a moth's wing. One thing that scales allow their owners to do is if you're a butterfly or a moth or even a little mosquito and those scales come off really easily, actually, if you fly into a spider's web, you may be able to get out of the spider web by leaving the scales. The scales will come off of the wings and the butterfly or moth or even mosquito may be able to get out of the spider's web because the scales will stick and the rest of the body will be able to get away. So it's kind of a cool, cool thing. 
we have a question from Matthew about back to, back to bees. Um, he wants to know why they would have biting mouth parts when all they do is make honey. Um, so they don't just make honey. Um, so the in many insects, the mandibles are sort of like um, the, the, the tools that an insect uses to sort of manipulate their surroundings, interact with things, and grab things, uh, sort of like how we use our hands. Um, and so the, the, the honeybees will use their, their mandibles, I think, to, to like mold um, their, their nest, to, to do things like that, to do um, more, I guess, caretaking things within the nest. And so they're, they'll, they don't just um, use them to chew uh, food. They, don't, they, don't, they wouldn't use them to chew food, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Well, some things like, like wasps can can chew wood and then make something out of it when they make their nests, right? Yeah, and so I think I think honeybees. I think that's how they like manipulate the wax that they use that they secrete to make their honeycomb. Yeah, um, using their mandibles. So that's why the way they would they would use that. But the other yeah. insects will also use their mandibles for things that aren't just catching food. Um, it's sort of a, it's sort of a, a can be a multi-purpose tool. To maintain species. So now we're looking at an individual amatidium. So amatidia are what the facets of the eyes are called. And these are the little uh, receptors that mosquitoes use to capture light. And you can see that this little facet of the eye is round. That means that it gets light from many directions. And then if this mosquito was still alive, its eye would not be collapsed like this. And so the eyeballs, instead of being all shrunken like we see right now, the eyeballs would be round. And what that means is that if you're a mosquito, you have like almost a 360 degree view. And that's really helpful because life of an insect is really fast. And when they're alive, everything happens really, really fast. So you have to be able to see what's coming at you and you have to be able to go and see what it is that you want to find. When, when a mosquito uh, comes to bite you, it's going to probably be sensing the uh, CO2 that comes from your breath. So it has receptors for that as well. And the receptors, some of the receptors may be on, on the antenna. You can see that the antenna are broken off on this uh, mosquito. And I think that this is a male mosquito. Male mosquitoes don't bite, but they have a proboscis like a female mosquito. And this is what the proboscis looks like. So it's kind of like an elephant's trunk and it can move kind of like an elephant's trunk. And so if this were a female, uh, we might be able to see the sharp tips of the stylet or the stylets actually that are inside the uh, tube that the mosquito bites with. So the, this is just the sheath. The thing that's in the middle is just the sheath and it's actually going to be split. It's gonna have a slit on the, I think the opposite side and the fascicle, which is the part that actually sticks in you and bite you, bites you is inside this tube and the fascicle is smooth it's smoother and it's muscular and it has i think not all insects or not all mosquitoes may have this but it has these little stylets that are super super sharp that stick into your skin and there are at least four of them and the fascicle is probably called a fascicle because it's like the word fascist or fasces or fasces, which is refers to a bundle that's wrapped up. And that's kind of what a fascicle is look, looks like. You have a bundle of four stylets plus a center part that is the tube that the, the saliva from the mosquito comes out of and the blood goes into. And they're separate tubes, actually. It's really cool. It's really creepy. It looks like a calla lily, uh, like a three-dimensional sort of calla lily. And you can see where the saliva comes out and where the blood goes in. But on a male mosquito, 
kind of boring. The male mosquitoes may not eat or they may eat nectar, but they don't drink blood. So now you can see the screen that we're driving on. And um, we have a question. Uh, Haley wants to know what you, what you study in school to work in this type of lab. Um, so my bachelor's degree is in entomology. Um, so I basically just studied, focused on studying insects ever since I joined, uh, started, started joining college. I don't you know what your background is, Scott. You do my craft in general. What do you here? Yeah, that's all I do. Um, I have a degree in English and biology. And so it's, it's helped me out because for, for many years, I used to rewrite uh, publications for people and rewrite grant proposals for people. And then um, it just happened that I fell into doing electron microscopy. The kind of electron microscopy that I started out with is transmission electron microscopy, which is different from scanning electron microscopy. So we're, what we're doing right now is scanning electron microscopy and we have a, a, an unhappy looking fly on here right now. And it's a little bit bright, so let's fix the contrast a little bit. Um, but so sometimes you just accidentally happen into doing the things that you do. And that's kind of what I did. I started doing, but electron microscopy, what we're doing is super, super fun. And we're really lucky to be able to do this kind of stuff. It's really exciting. You feel like you get to see things that most people don't ever get to see. So do you recognize this? I don't recognize the species of fleet. I recognize that it's a fleet that looks at for eyes, but that's so cute. These are some bad little dudes. And you can see there's an eye spot. They probably can't see very well, but they have a really small eye spot right there. And one on the other side. And you can see that um, behind the eye, it has a tucked in antenna. And then you can see on its face where it has these little spines that help it get stuck in your hair if they're in there biting you. And you can also see maybe part of the proboscis. And the proboscis, so they, fleas will bite you and they have these little features called laciniae and they're really kind of creepy. It looks like, if we get to pull the contrast and brightness up on this as well. It's kind of like a chainsaw blade. So this is one of the uh, biting mouth parts. And you see that it has this really kind of rough edge sharp edges to it that cut into your skin when it's biting you. And then they can suck blood that way. So this is one of them. And it's sort of like from the word laceration, it's kind of the same thing. They can cut into your skin with these fine mouth parts. Um, uh, someone in the chat asked if you had any gnats on 
And that's sort of like a generic term for a tiny uh, fly uh, that likes to kind of swarm around you and annoy you. Um, so it doesn't refer to any specific insect. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you have any like flies that might be considered gnats on there. We have an aphid. An aphid? Yeah. Yeah. So we the aphid is near this, but I just found this is kind of cool too. The caterpillar of some kind? Yeah. Yeah, so you can see it has three sets of legs on uh, on the top part of its body, and then there's another set of legs further down. Uh, I think we're not supposed to call them legs when they go on beyond if it's an insect. They're sort of like fake legs. Yeah, I think they're called pro legs. Yeah, professional legs. <laughs> they have another name too, I forget what it is. Yeah, but it is a pro leg. And I think they like have like a, I don't know, like crochet is something like that is referred to. As yeah, that's what they do. Well. I don't know if it's that's the whole leg structure or just the, the span of, of like hooks that they have at the end. Um, Crochet. Crochet. Yeah. So this is a this is the tip of one of the uh, one of the legs. It has little biting, cutting parts on it, or grabbing parts, and then it has little feety, so it can figure out where its feety go. And so we should be able to. So if we go down and we look at the other legs on the bottom part of the body, they look a little bit different. More creepy. And so these are called crochets. Or they're spelled crochets. Maybe we're not pronouncing them correctly. And you can actually see some brachisomes on this one. Brachisomes from leafhoppers get on everything. And so we're trying to focus this. This is 20,000 times magnified. Focus is a little bit better right there. And they're still pretty small. So look at those little claws. It's really cool. So I want to go try to find the aphid. There we go. Yeah, so the, the I, I just confirmed via Google that the like the, the full leg is called the pro leg, like the, the not leg. And then yeah. you can see at the end is called the, the crochet. Yeah. yeah, that's because nobody wanted to uh to say that they actually have more than uh, the normal number of legs. They have, they're have they still insects, but they have yeah, more than the, uh, six legs. Make sure that the, the term leg was referring to the same homologous structure as the two different species. That's and right. Life stages. So one thing about this, this could be a gnat because this is a, a flying aphid. And it looks like a mess. Yeah. And what happens with aphids, we don't see them, we don't get them really often, but if we do get them, we need to be able to dry them so that they won't shrink. And so the way that we do that is called critical point drying. And we'll take them and they may be, uh, they may be fresh. Maybe somebody froze them or something like that to kill them. If we put them in ethanol and then we put them in stronger ethanol until it's 100% ethanol, we can keep them in ethanol and then we can put them in 100% ethanol in um, an instrument called a critical point dryer. And we can take the uh, pressure and temperature up in the critical point dryer and we push, we use, um, carbon dioxide, liquid carbon dioxide that's really cold, 
to push all the ethanol out of the tissue until it becomes pure liquid carbon dioxide. And then we can draw that carbon dioxide off above its critical point, which is 1,072 pounds per square inch and 31 degrees Celsius. Above that point is the critical point for carbon dioxide. And if we can draw the carbon dioxide that replaced the ethanol that was replaced the water that was in the tissue, like in an aphid, then that, ethyl, that, that um, carbon dioxide, when it comes out of the sample, it leaves the sample in a solid uh, state, which is much like it originally looked like. So it doesn't shrivel up when it loses all the water. So I know it's a little bit tricky thing to try to explain or I'm doing a poor job of it. But if we had critical point dried this aphid, it wouldn't look like such a mess that it does right now. You can see one of its eyes right here. You can see it has a compound eye. And you can see again that those eyes have bracosomes on them from. that come from um, leaf hopper. Oh, sorry. There's so much beam energy hitting the sample that the sample sometimes will look like it's moving. It is kind of like shrinking a little bit when the electron beam hits it. So let's go find this. Another question. Um, if, do you have a favorite bug to study? So um, I, my research is on uh, these, 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 this group of ants that are referred to as trap jaw ants. Um, and they, they have basically um, little mouse traps on their face. Their, their mandibles are modified to, to be spring loaded and so they can bite really fast to catch their prey. So it's quite an impressive uh, mechanism. So those are probably my favorite insects because I, I study them uh, as my primary research system. Uh, I don't know, Scott, do you have a, a favorite bug to study? I like ants too and I like uh, I like leaf hoppers because they're so much fun and they're sort you of- You can't get away from them, they just come up everywhere, right? So yeah. The microphones are everywhere. Yeah. So what's this? Yeah, so this is the uh, Marmesia again. Uh, I think it's probably you remember, you probably don't remember what color it was when you put it on there, right? Um, <laughs> I don't know, brown? Yeah, it's probably, it's probably a, a Nermesia, I think Nigra Ventris is the, the species name. They're, it's, they're, they're called jack jumpers. Um, they're like a fairly sizable ant, maybe about the size of a, a big black carpenter ant you find around here. Maybe a little bit bigger. Um, but they're, uh, they're quite visual. Um, and they're called jack jumpers because they're, they're quite accomplished jumpers uh, for ants. Um, um, but they're they're quite uh, I don't know uh, aggressive. Yeah, they can, and they can be kind of quite monstrous looking in terms of ants. They have these really long, uh, toothy mandibles that they use to to catch their prey. And the mandibles actually they can move quite fast. They have very they have muscles that are adapted to to, uh, to contract quickly, so the mandibles move very fast. Um, but they're, not, they're not like trap dry ants. They don't have like a, a spring loaded mechanism. They're not the fastest ants out there. So they're not as cool. Not as cool as trap dry ants. They're still cool ants. Um, but yeah, they'll, uh, if you, I've learned first, uh, these are, these are, this, this is an ant that I've gone out and collected personally in Australia. Um, we, we brought them back live to try to see their jump mechanism, but they didn't do really well. We didn't, we didn't get any papers out of it. But um, they are, uh, yeah, if you disturb them, they'll, they'll aggressively chase you um, for, for several feet uh, or meters away from the nest. and. Kind of like Indian, it's not very pleasant. Their things are quite, they're not like the worst ant things, but they're, they're quite noticeable. I think they have like some, some content in their venom that is, is quite easy to become allergic, to have allergic reaction to for some people. So it's, it's kind of worth look, look out for that. But um, if you don't mess with them too much, they're, they're pretty, pretty okay. They're fun ant though. So we can see that they have what, although there's uh, there's some web on this 
They're smaller than fungal hyphae, yeah. I think, according to me. But uh, these are really complex, uh, good eyes. They're they're much better than the ones that look like raspberries that we've seen. And so you can just from seeing the eyes like this, you can see that they can see very well. And they have two compound eyes. Below the eye, you can see the joint uh, of the uh, mandible. To the right of the uh, or to the yeah to the right of the eye, we can see where this broken off antenna is. And then on the left of the eye, covering up the eye is, is the antenna. That's the, where it broke. And then. We can see also many insects like wasps and, and bees and ants have other eyes on the top of their head. And those eyes are called ocelli. And they're also called simple eyes. They probably can't, don't let you see very well. But they help you with your orientation to the sun and the light. So there are actually three ocelli. You can see two of the ocelli bump pretty well. And then the third one is in the back. It's a little bit hard to see. And then you can see these little sensory feet sticking out of the top of the head. So uh, in terms of like a cell, not, not all insects have those, those structures. Some of them have lost them, um, but usually they'll elude it. Insects either have three of them or one of them. Um, and then talking about uh, how big the eyes are, are Marmesia, that's not necessarily common in ants. Most ants don't have the best vision. Some of them actually lost their eyes entirely. Um, but Marmesia are one of the, the few groups that have very, very good eyesight for, for, their, uh, for being ants. So we can see that it's a true bug, right? Yeah. And we can see that it's uh, its legs have busted off, so it must have been rolled a little bit. And we can also see that the rostrum may be broken or bent. This is um, called a, a minute pirate bug. And so it, it looks like minute, but I think it's minute because it's really small. You can see that it's only about two millimeters long. So this is a very small bug. And you can, we can call it a bug because it's a true bug. And we can see its rostrum. And so this is the same kind of biting mouth, mouth parts that uh, it can move that forward. It doesn't just lie against the, uh, the under part of the body like that. So this is the rostrum right here. and. It's the same kind of thing that a bed bug has when it bites. It will have something like this and it's split at the tip and has a little piece that comes out, a little sharp piece that comes out. Um, yeah, so these are, I think they're, these are also sometimes known as like in, insidious bugs or whatever because they, um, they're, they're, they're predatory. Um, they don't really have a reason to, to bite people, but sometimes they'll they'll frequently just fly up and bug you. And so their, their size, they're quite, the, the, the bite is quite uh, irritating. Um, so, so they're sort of annoying little things. But they're, they're, I mean, they're, they're beneficial, but they're predatory on, on things that might hurt plants. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's surprising how, how, how you feel the bite for their size. I'm not sure what these are. They look like mold spores. I think that they're probably mold spores. They don't look like they're they're bigger than bacteria. Generally bigger than bacteria. I'm not sure what we're looking at. You see some little crystals right here too. Mm -hmm. So we see, sometimes we see little crystals on the uh, insect faces. Sometimes we see little waxy features on here. And um, these little wax things that we're looking at right now are sometimes on mites. 
we find them on mice and, and we wonder if uh, maybe this assassin bug was eating mice. Or maybe there's some mice around here. So sometimes we'll find mice on insects. Unfortunately, we haven't found any uh, on this set of insects that we're looking at. You can see the compound eye. And then you can see these other feathery um, things. And I'm not sure what they are. So this is on the, the bug still? This is something that's stuck to the bug, but not part of the bug. Mm. Cool. So you can see it, it may have come from the spider. Mm. So you can see that the base of it is sticking out there. So these are pretty sure these are a form of mold spores. legs are broken off. You can see one of its legs. You can see some uh, butterfly scales. You can see one of its feet right here. And once again, we can see some brachisomes. A little bit different. Maybe from another kind of leaf hopper. And so these are claws, and then also sometimes the claws, which are called the the uh the arm parts of an insect or the leg parts are called tarsi. The end parts of the leg are called tarsi. Then this is the claw at the end. And then sometimes they have these little components that will can be inflated and will help them stick to a surface. Uh, like if you're a mountain climber and you're reaching for a crack, if you're an insect, you can swell up this component of your uh, of your hand and, and make it swell into that space so that you can hold on to something. So it's one of the ways that um, some insects allow themselves to uh, hold on to surfaces. This is a moss scalion. Yeah, it looks like it. So these scales, so this kind of scale doesn't have any holes in it. This is more like a mosquito scale. And it's kind of like a feather. They, they function a little bit like feathers do. And then you can see a lot of little uh, mold spores in here. So this, um, this little bug that we're looking at was probably in a collection with some other bugs and got rolled around in all the other bugs. This is the front part of the spider? Yeah. I wanted to try to get a better image of it and I took its legs off so it's still cannot see the claws very well. See the eye. Some spiders have urticating hairs, and uh, for example, tarantulas do, and tarantulas can fire their hairs at you, and urticating means itching, uh, and, and some uh, tarantulas can fire those hairs in, and they'll stick into your eye, for example, really, really fine hair, so you have to be really nice when you handle your tarantula. Yeah, I think I think that, that that's like a feature that's unique to tarantulas. I think one of like the the diagnostic characters is to have your 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 hairs. Have you ever have you ever looked at those under the? Yeah, yeah. Because I've got some 
uh, for like a future bug scope event, I've got a couple of like immature tarantulas that died in, under my watch that are in the freezer. So yeah, I'd like to see that. Them. We've had people send us tarantulas before, but they're like so big. Yeah, you can't really put them on there. That they're really like, and they're all like, they're rotted sometimes too. Yeah, also up love the DJ hook on one for another, another event. Um, uh, uh, Haley in the chat asked if we have a mantis. And I don't think we do, but we do have a ambush bug, which has mantis-like forelegs. Maybe we can look at those again at some point after we look at this. Yeah, I wish we had a mantis. They're, they're so cool. Yeah, but they tend to be, um, Larger, so you have to get the. I mean, they, they, we're limited in space, but we can put them in place. Um, so, kind of have to get one of the an immature mantis that died before its time um, to put on there. So, but, uh, that and usually, like, you don't notice the mantis because they're so good at camouflage until, until they're larger. So, you don't get those things as much, I don't think. What is this? This is a, I think it's a rove beetle. It's hard to tell. Mm -hmm. You can see. The pelt, they, you can see the, the things that we had focused in on. You have uh, mandibular palps, which I think is what this is. So the palps help uh, taste the food and help manipulate the like food. It might be a labial palp. Okay, so you have mandibular and labial palps, right? Well, I don't know if you have, so there's maxillary and labial palps. I don't know if there's mandibular palps. Okay. Um, but it looks, like, it looks like the larger ones probably have maxillary palps than the. Uh, the inner one because it's coming off of that one singular structure that's so like on the outside of the mouth parts is probably the, the labium. Okay. So that's why we have an entomologist here. And then you can see also that it has fangs. These are the mandibles up here on the top. Yeah, yeah you, you can definitely see that the, the larger palps definitely aren't connecting to the mandible structures. So those aren't, I don't think those are mandible palps. And we can see where the uh, Mandible has been used. Sometimes the mandibles are uh, are worn a little bit. So these are the tips for the mandibles. So yes, let's go um, let's go take a look at the assassin bug. It's as close as we're going to get to a uh, to a praying mantis. Okay, so let's fix the light. It's dark and scary now. And also you can see that, so you see those little arms and the arm on the, on the left is really, really bright. And that's because the arm is loose and it is not, um, it's not grounded. So it's broken and the electron beam is hitting the arm and making it and putting it full of electrons and it's really really bright because the electrons can't go to ground thankfully on the other arm the the left arm that's on the right that is much better grounded and so we can see that arm and so this is comparable to as as josh said this is comparable to uh the arms on a praying mantis where they they can go and grab things and then hold them really tightly while they chew them, while they eat them. And so if we look at this, you can see that it's just a really devastating looking kind of uh, arm. And if we look at it up close, we can see these little spines. And if we look at the spines up close, they're really cool looking. So let's fix the contrast and brightness a little bit. Try to. I should do it manually. We're going to pull the contrast up and pull the brightness down. And so these are really beautiful little um, sort of teeth or tines that are on the inside of these really sort of muscular looking arms. 
And so if the ambush bug goes and attacks you, then it's going to grab you with these pincher-like arms and these little sharp things that are really beautiful right here are what holds on to you really tight. So praying mantises have something like this. You can see how they would they would hold really well. Yeah, and they're, it's, it's quite impressive when you see. So these are this is a common, a very common insect you guys can if you were like walking around Illinois in the in the fall, um, like in the, in the prairie areas where you have goldenrod and that sort of thing. They're very common on flowers. They they they're pretty they're pretty well camouflaged. You kind of have to look for them, but you can find them. And they're not maybe maybe like three or four millimeters in length. They're not that big. Um, but they can take down and, and, and grip and, and hold on to very large prey compared to their body size. So they'll, they're, it's not uncommon for them to eat like honeybees or bumblebees. Um, so they, they're, yeah, they're, they're quite an impressive grip for sure. And you can see wheel bugs are bigger, right? Yeah, 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 wheel bugs are. Yeah, I think they're like the, they're certainly the, the largest common assassin bug you find around here. It's not the largest assassin bug in, in Illinois. And they can hurt you if they bite you. Yeah, their their bites are, uh, are quite quite nasty if you mess with them. But they're, they're just one of those bugs where as long as you leave alone, they won't mess with you. They're not very aggressive. They only bite if handled. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if uh, ambush bugs. I presume I presume they could probably break skin. I don't know what their bites feel like though. If they can. I uh, well, I do a lot of. I used to do a lot of high speed videography where I film insects doing things in slow motion. Uh, and I tried really hard, uh, just kind of for, for fun, to, to film these guys catching prey, just to see how fast they're able to, to work this, 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 this prey capture mechanism. But they never cooperated for me. They, they, were, they, they were too shy. They wouldn't eat in front of the camera. So I never got any <laughs> shots. Oh. So this is one of those great big forearms. And then you can see the rost the rostrum, and that's really probably pretty hard too. Yeah, you know, we had another request from Scarlet to see a caterpillar after this. We were able to get back into the Okay. Do you, do you know so what are those like are those those wart like structures part of the cuticle? Or are they is it covered in something? I think they're part of the cuticle. I think they're armored. They are. I think they're just bumpy like that. I've they're got a, a, a colleague and friend who is uh, his, his, his expertise is in, in, in this like assassin bugs, in particular insects. So I might shoot him a text later today and see if he knows what, what that is, what, what, what the function or the name of those bumps are. So these are pollen. These are little pollen grains. That are also stuck to the assassin bug. They're really, really cool. So we'll go. I want to look at the pollen because I think it's cool, and then let's go look at the caterpillar. Yeah. Pollen bugs too. Yeah. Okay, so let's go and find a small caterpillar. You can see that the microscope is driving to that place. And now we're going to pull the contrast down a little bit. And let's go look at the mouth. Let's go look at the face of the caterpillar. And you can see it's mandibles, but they're under, I forget what this other part's called in the middle. Uh, probably the labrum. Um, yeah, it's called the labrum. They might have, I know an ant, in addition to the labrum, they also have a structure called the pipe, which is like the front part of the head that can sometimes cover the mouth part. I, I don't know if that's the, something that just ants have or other insects have as well. No, I think it's probably what we're looking at. So, this is 
the head of the caterpillar and we can see this little disc-like thing on here. And the disc-like thing is the clypeus, I think. I'll, I'll bring up a diagram of caterpillar heading out and you know what to see. Yeah, and then I'll be wrong. And then so we can see the mouth parts. We can see the little palps. We can see these little stubby antennae on the head like this right here. And then we can see also that they have eyes. And they have, it looks like uh, six eyes right here on this one side. So presumably there are six eyes on the other side as it well. It is the, uh, it's the labrum. Oh, okay. But they do have a, a what's called a frontopipia, just, just the, the part of the head like behind that. So we can see these little spikes sticking out and this just helps uh, it doesn't have very good eyes, but it can tell if anything's touching it using all those spikes that are on its head. And then these things down below are palps that help to uh, taste prospective food. At the tips, they have these little sensory organs that help them sort of taste and smell things that they might want to eat. Sorry, it's so dirty. And then we can see some other little palps on here. We can see some of the eyes on the other side of the head right here. Just this little dome-like thing. They're facing sideways. And then we can show you that it really does look like a caterpillar. And you can see it's a little arms or legs, and then we can see its toe leg, and then we can see its tail. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, so bright. What happened? Sorry. So this is part of its tail. I don't know what that is. It looks actually like these are um, something that will allow it to grasp. Yeah, so it's got, I don't know, if that, I think that's a specific name, but I forget what it is. Well, like it's got like another pair of pro legs that are just on like the very last segment. And they're sort of a little bit chunkier than the other pro legs. Yeah. Um, I think the, 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 the pro step part is bigger. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't, it probably has a specific name, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. You can see what the cuticle looks like. It has these little very, very small features. You can see little kitty. You can see that it's shrunken a little bit. And now we can see the pro leg with the little crochet. Kind of creepy looking. functions like the, the part of the Velcro to grab things. Yeah, isn't that neat? Really, really wild. Another question from Haley, what do you do in a normal day for your job? I'm not really a graduate student still, um, but I do a lot of uh, uh, analyzing data, collecting data, writing up papers, reading papers, working with other, we're working with other students. Um, I'm teaching that semester, I'll work on teaching the class that I'm teaching that semester. Do you want to chime in, Scott, for what you do in a typical day? What I do is I, um, I help people work with the electron microscope. So this electron microscope, and then there's another electron microscope that's a uh, transmission electron microscope. It's a completely different way of, um, of imaging where we take something and we embed it in plastic, something that's really small, and we embed it in plastic uh, after fixing it and infiltrating it so that it fits 
so that it uh, goes in in a lifelike state into plastic. And so we'll cut ultra thin sections of those things, put them on little tiny three millimeter grids, put the grids in a transmission electron microscope and beam electrons through the sample. And then we can see what the uh, inside of uh, things look like. So when we're doing scanning electron microscopy, we're looking at something from the outside. When we're doing transmission electron microscopy, we're looking at the insides of things. And that's how we see inside of cells. So that's how we see the mitochondria and the nucleus and all the little pieces of the inside of a cell and little cilia and things like that. Um, so I do help with transmission electron microscopy, scanning electron microscopy, and then in order to make all of those things work, we have all kinds of prep equipment like ultra microtomes and diamond knives and uh, sputter coaters for uh, making, putting gold palladium on the sample. So you spend your whole day sort of like helping people uh, make their samples, help people focus, help people get the best possible images. And we learn a lot because we get to work with all these graduate students and postdocs, and they're often doing really, really cool stuff, and they're really focused on what they're doing. And it's really, we're just lucky to be able to work with people like that. And we're lucky to have all these cool, fun pieces of equipment to uh, mess around with. So even like a day like today. So it's like super, super fun and you just feel so lucky. This is about a $400,000 electron microscope and the scanning transmission electron microscope that we have when it was new, it would be like probably $1.2 million. So these microscopes, um, they have their own rooms, they have their own chilled water, uh, they have their own air pressure, they have their own electricity, they have water that goes through them and they have air that goes through them and nitrogen that goes through them. All of these things are really kind of complicated and it's all so that you can see something that's really small and get really good images of it and it's super, super fun.
So yeah, we didn't know what this was. It, it looks like it's armor. So thank you. The background that we see when we see all these little dots next to this pirate bug right here, this is um, double stick carbon tape and it has these little craters in it. And so the, the carbon tape is what we stick our samples to. So this is the background of everything that we're looking at. Everything is stuck to carbon tape like this. And the carbon tape, carbon is conductive and also um, it's, co it's been coated with gold palladium. The gold palladium is maybe nine to, well, sometimes we make it kind of thick, so 20 nanometers thick. So nanometers are really, really small. 20 nanometers is really pretty small. But we have a little bit of, of that on there. And then this is, not sure, a rope beetle. I'm going to look up a quick, you know, off the top of your head, how, how, what fraction of an inch a nanometer would be for people that might not be familiar with the metric system at that scale. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll look it up. So there's, so there's 2.54 centimeters in an inch, right? And so that's, Three point nine three seven times ten to the minus eight. That would be like a point oh 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 eight oh seven oh's, uh, and then three nine seven oh's. So very 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 small. So the reason that we can see these things is because the electron beam is that diameter itself. The electron beam may be a nanometer in diameter in some cases, and that means that it has a, a gives us a better image, a better ability to see things that are that small. And so this is a scanning electron microscope, although you don't see it, the um, electron beam is constantly rastering, constantly going across this, the same way that you look at a TV. So an electron microscope is actually what TVs used to be called cathode ray tubes. Now they're not the same that because we have LED TVs, but uh, what we're doing is this an electron microscope is like an old version of a TV and it's a it's a really uh, specialized version of a cathode ray tube, and the cathode would be on the top, and instead of beaming, uh, instead of uh, making light go across the front of your TV screen, it has a very very fine probe, a very fine beam of electrons that's going rastering constantly across the sample. So every time we change the mag, for example, you see the lines go by really really fast. That's a whole bunch of really, really fine uh, electron beam that's going past the sample. It's beaming electrons at the sample. And then the electrons that come back from the sample go to a detector. And the detector that we're using in this case is if you see what, what we have on the screen now, you see a cone shape on the top. The cone shape is where the electrons are coming down the column. And we have a very poor image of the samples that we're looking at with this uh, CCD camera. To the right, we see a sort of a cage. And that cage has a 300 volt positive bias on it. And that means that the electrons, which have a negative bias on them, which are negatively charged, the electrons, the secondary electrons, the high energy electrons are going to come down. We can't see it. The electron beam is hitting the sample. When it hits the sample, it knocks electrons out of the conductive coating on the surface of the sample. And those electrons are pulled by this 300 volt positive bias into that cage that we can barely see. And that cage, beyond the cage, is a scintillator. And the scintillator will send the image that is collected from the uh, electrons to where we can see it. So what's happening is, 
every time these are like there's millions of electrons or billions of electrons every second then some of them are bright and some more signal and some of them have less signal and that's what's allowing us to see what we see so if we look at the pelt on this insect right here that we're looking at these are little sensory features that help it taste its food and those are at about about five microns the, the little uh the little window that i have on there is about five micrometers which is about five thousand uh nanometers in diameter and we can go a little bit higher and we can see where it's been what it's been sticking its pelt to. Oh, yeah. make a comment about the grass grain you mentioned it looks like there's like a white tiny white line that constantly comes coming down i assume that's showing where the current yep raster is you guys can kind of see that uh, on the left side of the screen yeah um and then we got a question in the chat um what types of things do scientists look at using electron microscope uh, uh, and what can it show that a normal microscope can't, an optical microscope can't? So an, an optical microscope is limited by light and light has certain wavelengths from uh, the color is, color is 400 to 700 nanometer wavelengths. And so we have glass lenses and the, in the uh, microscopy suite, we have lots of light microscopes. So those still get used. And we have lots of different versions of those. We also have a 3D X-ray capability, which Josh, Josh uses sometimes uh, to uh, get X-ray images of his uh, samples. People are building things out of materials, really small things out of materials, and they want to see how well they did. And some people are biologists, and they want to see what something looks like up close that has to do with biology, and that's why we would use a scanning electron microscope. Some people are studying uh, really small things like uh, bacteria. Some people are studying viruses, which we can't really see viruses using a scanning electron microscope, but with the transmission electron microscope, we can see individual viruses. We haven't looked at um, COVID viruses with our transmission electron microscope, but we could if we wanted to uh, look at COVID. We're working with people, uh, a couple of different groups who look at herpes virus and are interested in finding a way to cure uh, herpes, for example. So we work with lots of people who are working with different kinds of materials as well. And they're making like little screens for imaging and uh, lots of different kinds of things like that there's just all kinds of stuff people are studying uh how cement looks how concrete looks all the little com uh little composite uh components of uh of concrete and people are looking uh at metals people are making things that they want to that they want to be able to image uh at high resolution and so we're really happy to be able to help them. So we have light microscopes, we have electron microscopes, we have X-ray microscopes, and then we have lots and lots of pieces of equipment that help people uh, prepare their samples for those various kinds of microscopes. We also have uh, microscopes that allow us to uh, stain uh, samples with different qualities of stain and different colors of stain and we can do lots of different kinds of fluorescent microscopy so people instead of using like solid stains now use fluorescent stains and then we can collect the fluorescent images of the sample so people are looking at cells and tissue and looking and seeing uh, how they respond to different kinds of treatment So we even had somebody the other day had some teeth in the laboratory and uh, this somebody who left so I, I was I got rid of the teeth. So this is just a pelt that we're looking at. Put them under your pillow, Scott, so you get rid of them? Yeah, no, I didn't. I had them sitting on my desk and it was disgusting so I got rid of them.
I think this is we're wrapping up at noon, right? So we got 15 minutes left. So if you guys have any questions, be sure to put them in the chat before the event the event ends. Yeah. So this is the uh, the row of beetles that we're looking at, and you can see that uh, insects have exoskeletons. So humans have endoskeletons. Our skeleton is on the inside, and our flesh and skin are on the outside. Insects are really the opposite. They're kind of like if you were wearing a coat of armor, you wouldn't be able to feel anything that was touching you. You would hear it banging against the armor, but you might not feel something up close that was touching the armor. So insects have armor. They have an exoskeleton. And when we look, for example, right now, these, what we're looking at right now is the leg of this beetle. And it has individual segments that are called tarsi, and then it has claws at the tip. And then it has little CD on it. And some of those CD are so that the insect can feel when it, when it moves its arm, when it bends its arm, the CD will tell it that the, uh, that the uh, different tarsi are touching each other so that it can feel that it actually moves. It's kind of interesting, different way of living. And I saw this the other day and I don't know what it is. It looks like it's probably like a, one of those hard CETA like the CD that we saw that are um, used on the ambush bars. And then these are insect claws. So the claws, there's a, a sort of a tendon inside called an unguitractor. And when the unguitractor pulls backwards and the claws close, and then when it lets go, the claw, when it lets go, the claws open again. We can see that down here is a wing scale. Somebody's wing scale fell off. Uh, so that that like cracking in the background is the gold palladium cracking, right? Or is it just does that happen because the plate's a little bit older, or is that just something that happens when you coat the sample? No matter what. Do you see like how there's like the the cracks in the background? Oh, is that just because the, the sample, the, the plate is a little bit older and so it kind of just cracks over time? Or yeah, so it's going to dry because there's a vacuum and so we're going to see those cracks. So if we had a really, really flat sample, a flat, smooth sample, and we coated it with gold palladium to make the sample conductive, if we went to a really high magnification, and got really good focus on the gold palladium on the surface of something that's smooth, the gold palladium looks like dried mud. So it looks like a lake bed when everything is all dry. It's really kind of interesting. We use gold palladium instead of in the old days, people used to coat their samples, they would sputter coat their samples with very fine layers of gold. Gold has a really bumpy surface of it on it. And so if you look at something up really close at super high magnification, it would look bumpy. And so instead of using just gold, we have a, um, a combination of, I think, 70% gold and 30% palladium, um, which is another precious metal. And the combination of uh, gold and palladium gives us a much finer surface to look at. And we don't see that surface very well until we get to a really high mag on a um, on a really smooth surface. I have a, a, a question that maybe might be a fun fact for people in the chat. Um, like, so how like how 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 much like what's the monetary value of the gold that you're covering the sample with? Like is it is it negligible? Like because it's just so thin. Well, so when we <laughs> For a few years, we didn't do this, but we work with government costing and government costing helps figure out what our fees for all of these things that we do. 
So we have to uh, come up with fees that will pay for our instruments or at least pay for the, uh, the contracts that we have to repair the instrument. So a few years ago, just a few years ago, we found out from government costing that we have to charge people for the gold, for the precious metals that we put on samples. So whenever somebody uses a sputter coater to coat a sample, maybe with uh, nine nanometers of gold palladium, we have to charge them 30 cents per nanometer for gold and platinum used to be the platinum the price of platinum changes it's about 45 cents for a nanometer so a nanometer is a billionth of a meter so we're coding something with a billionth of a meter or several billionths of a meter of a precious metal and Besides the charge for using the piece of equipment, it's 45 cents for platinum and 30, 30 cents for a nanometer of gold. So how, like, what's the, the area of one of these, like, like the average stud plate, how much would that be? Like how many, how many nanometers are there? Thankfully, they don't know that these things have an area. Oh. <laughs> so. So we don't want to ask too many questions because we might have to start measuring the area as well as the thickness of the gold palladium. But uh, <laughs> it's just the way that it works Maybe out. Maybe I shouldn't ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> so if we use silver, silver doesn't work because it's tarnished, it tarnishes. If we use platinum, we could coat our samples with platinum and it would be fine. It would it, it would look well. It's just a little bit more expensive. Recently, platinum got a little bit cheaper than gold for a while. Uh, kind of interesting. I don't know where it is right now. And so, what happens is when we use these, we we when we use a sputter coater, the sputter coater has a thin film of gold palladium or platinum or whatever it is that we want to coat. Somebody wants to coat their sample with. And so there's there's a disc that's about two and a half inches in diameter, and that disc will wear out in the in the place where the gold palladium wears comes down to uh, coat your sample. It also coats the inside of the chamber. And so what happens is eventually the disc will will fall apart. So a central part of it will fall out, and then we have uh, evaporators that we can use. Sometimes people want to coat their samples a different way, and we can actually heat something up so that it um, we can run electricity through it until it gets so hot that it starts uh, firing off bits of itself. And so we can coat other things with gold and gold palladium and platinum and copper and whatever somebody else wants to coat. We also can coat samples just with, with plain carbon. And so the whole thing about it is that we need to be able to get a fine coat that's not too thick. Carbon is conductive, but it's not as conductive as gold palladium uh, for what we're doing. We have another question. Um, the general, what, what, like, what, can you give us an introduction of what bubble scope is in general and how it normally would work for someone wants to sign up for? How would they go about doing that? So I can post, a, I'll just post a link. As well, that people are so bug scope is something that we started in 1998. I got hired to come in here. Um, the microscope uh, was installed in December 1998. I got here in November 1998. We installed a, a different microscope. This is a newer one. And what we wanted to do was make it so that the microscope could be connected to the World Wide Web because in 1998, 1999, things were different. We had some really good coders here. And what we did was we were able to um, control the scanning electron microscope using computers and we're able to uh, project images from, take images from the electron microscope and put them online and we're able to create a website where people could then send us insects 
we would in, mount the insects on a stub, just like the one that we've seen here, uh, the, the metal stub, like this one on the right. Um, so people will send us instrument insects or we will mount them. Insects are arthropods because not everything we're looking at is exactly an insect with six legs. Um, and what we do is we set it up so that people have presets that they can go so they're already focused. People can go to those places, drive the electron microscope from their classroom, and they could do it from their classroom anywhere in the world. So from 19, from March 1999 up to October 2015, so about um, 16 years, we ran this one version of Bugscope and we did about a thousand sessions with people all over the world and classrooms were able to control an electron microscope from their desk or the teacher would help them uh, anywhere in the world. So we connected with some people in Tanzania, in Australia, uh, in uh, Korea, all over the world. And then, but most of the people were in the US. And so if you go to bugscope.beckman.illinois.edu, uh, you can see that we have uh, archived uh, images and the, uh, and the uh, typing that we used to use. We would, kids would ask us questions uh, typing into Bugscope and then we would answer them. So it wasn't speaking, it was uh, having people type their questions and having us type their answers and then people would be interested in what they were looking at. So when we got our new electron microscope in um, October 2015, this microscope that we're using right now has been very difficult to run bug scope on because of the way that it's set up. The software is not nearly as um, robust as we want it to. And so bug scope is a little bit is still a little bit flawed. So I'm having people, of course, uh, help us work on that, but it's been six years, almost six years. Bug scope is not as good as it could be. And so we're considering using Zoom instead and modifying what we do for bug scope. So what we would really prefer to do is have it set up so that each classroom or several classrooms could log in and uh, students could be sitting at their desks and they could be uh, looking at the images and typing us questions and several of us on this end will be typing the answers. So right now bug scope is a little bit rough and sometimes it drops offline and it's really very, very disappointing. And so if we cannot get this better, we're going to switch and we're probably going to do something like what we're doing today. So just look up bugscope.beckman.illinois.edu and you can see what bugscope.beckman, not Declan. Isn't Declan the name of Elvis Costello? Um, I don't know. Well, I, I posted the actual link in the chat, so they should be able to click on that. Good, they don't good. have to rely on the, um, the, the post captioning to look at. So I should say also that entomologists are the best people to talk about insects so and arthropods. So those of us who are just electron microscopists, we learn a lot about insects over the last 20 years but we're nowhere near as good as entomologists. And so what we've been able to do is offer free time on the electron microscope to um, entomologists if they will help us answer questions on bug scope. And that is a really big thrill because entomology is so cool. It's just like we're looking at an alien kind of life and it's really super, super interesting. Uh, sometimes people want to put other things in the microscope for bug scope. We have people who have done uh, forensics and things like that. So they want to look at like different kinds of 
weaves of cotton or something like that. And, and um, so sometimes people do things that aren't exactly associated with bugs. But uh, I hope that's a good starting answer. And thank you. Thank you for getting on with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for all of the questions.